so uh, we have seen yoneda lemma which can be called the fundamental theorem of category theory and now we are going to come back to categorical properties we have seen two categorical properties yeah what are they initial object and terminal object yeah not co initial object just initial and terminal objects fine so uh, now we are going to look at some more such constructions if you remember at at one point i explained that if you are talking about the category then there is some thickness in the morphisms because the home sets are thicker they contain more than one elements yeah and then there is a just the pre order collection yeah that whether there are morphisms or not and then pre orders and groups i mentioned like monoids they are they can be thought of as building blocks so uh, groups have parallel morphisms yeah so these parallel morphisms are going to be our first topic of discussion so we are uh, discussing now what are equalizers okay so equalizers are just La, let me describe everything diagrammatically so we are given two objects and a parallel pair of arrows yeah f and g and now we want to talk about a, a morphism yeah let me call that morphism d some morphism from d to a let me call it h such that fh is equal to gh fh is equal to gh and there should be universal such thing so uh, by this actually i am going to give you one more type of ways uh, one more way uh, where you could generalize injective functions yeah so i want some some morphism h which will make this happen fh is equal to gh now suppose we are working in sets can you tell me some such d that will always work yeah yeah singleton uh, if at all a is non empty if a is empty then obviously f and g can't really be distinct yeah it has to be the unique map so at that point we don't worry but if it is non empty then we have got you map it to any singleton oh sorry so singleton will not work actually right because singleton maybe that is precisely the point where f and g differ so therefore we won't necessarily get fh is equal to gh but you can always choose d to be empty set and h to be the empty function and then the composition is just going to be the empty function so those uh, compositions do agree with each other now this is the idea that we want to do in a universal sense so we will construct some e and some morphism e such that first property is that yeah that f e is equal to g e and second property says that whenever f h is equal to g h then there exists a unique arrow let's say k from d to e such that the diagram commutes so this one there exists a unique arrow k such that this diagram commutes which means e h e k is equal to h okay so this is the best possible solution to this problem we posed a problem we wanted to make sure fh is equal to gh and what is the best possible such solution amongst all such possible solutions you can see that this is the terminal one 
this is the terminal solution. Yeah, because we are saying there exists a unique way of factoring through E. And because it's a terminal in some appropriate category, yeah, we'll make this precise today. So, uh, that property makes sure that equalizers are <coughs> unique up to unique isomorphism. Okay. So, these, uh, so the pair E comma E is called the equalizer, sorry, an equalizer of F and G. So, something to note here that we are not just saying that capital E, that object is the equalizer. We are saying that that object together with this morphism, without morphism objects are nothing. Okay. So, you can even just say that this little e is the equalizer, but you can never say that capital E is the equalizer alone. Yeah? Because when we talk about little e, then it automatically has a domain. Its co-domain is just going to be A, which is already given to you in, in the form of that diagram. Okay. And such an equalizer. is uh, a terminal object in an appropriate category and hence any two equalizers are isomorphic in a unique way. Okay, so there is a unique isomorphism between any two equalizers. What do I mean by that? If E1 and E2 are two, uh, two equalizers, then there is a unique isomorphism from E1 to E2 and from E2 to E1. Where is this uniqueness of the isomorphism coming from? from the existence, there exists unique, yeah, that is what is forcing us to make this thing true, yeah, because if you remember when we were talking about two terminal objects, what we saw, T1 and T2 are terminal, then there is a unique morphism from T2 to T1, there is a unique morphism from T1 to T2 and the compositions also satisfy the properties so of the compositions like the round compositions in both sides, they have to be equal to the identity. So, here also uh, the same argument works and therefore, so thus we can talk about the equalizer of F and G. Okay, so fr from an equalizer to the equalizer yeah, we are just making this journey because it's unique up to unique isomorphism. Yeah. Articles are important when while writing English, but here also like in mathematics, they have lot of meaning. Okay, so uh, let's look at some simple examples. So, uh, in sets. Mm. What can we say? If A and B are two parallel arrows, what is E? All such things which make F and G equal after composition. X in A such that Fx equals Gx. Correct. X in A such that Fx is equal to Gx and 
little e is the injection is the inclusion in a right so this is correct now this shouldn't be a surprise actually if i say that this little e is always going to be a monomorphism very beautiful proof of diagram chasing yeah uh, that is what makes sure that these equalizers are unique so uh, sorry monomorphisms if e e is an equalizer then e is a monomorphism remind me what is the definition of a monomorphism if fh is equal to gh no fh equal to gh that's not the definition at least use the notations that we are doing so let's say k1 and k2 are two morphisms okay what uh, when is e going to be a monomorphism Well, yeah so let so suppose e k1 is equal to e k2 yeah we need need to show that k1 is equal to k2 okay so uh, if e k1 is equal to e k2 how can we use that post compose it with f and g individually so what can you say about e k1 f this is f e k1 and this is equal to g e k1 which is g e k1 okay similarly if i replace k k1 by k2 i will get the same identities so therefore there are two different ways in which like can you see that e k1 equal to a k2 by choosing e k1 equal to e k2 equal to h yeah so choosing and similarly for k2 so choosing h equal to e k1 equal to e k2 we get a unique factorization of h through e i e in other words what can we say that k1 is equal to k2 <coughs> so i mean let me go back to the picture i'm scrolling up so choose this h equal to e k1 and e k2 then there are two different factorizations i can choose d to e to be k1 or i can choose it to be k2 but because we know there exists a unique k so therefore uniqueness forces k1 to be equal to k2 so therefore what we have shown that if e e is an equalizer then e is a monomorphism in general there is a definition for all such monomorphisms so a morphism uh, e from c to d is said to be a regular monomorphism if there is a pair uh, d to d prime 
such that pair of morphisms such that E is the equalizer of F and G. Yeah, so regular monomorphisms are precisely those monomorphisms which occur in this particular fashion. So what we have shown, all split monos are monos or regular monos are monos. But in general, can we show that all monos are regular monos? Well, that is true in the category of sets. Yeah, because in category of sets, everything is correct. So maybe I can give you the, uh, this as an exercise. Yeah, so in sets, regular mono, if and only if mono. Okay, then uh, in, I mean, dually we have the notions of co-equalizer. Yeah, all the arrows are reversed. And we have the, the notion of regular epimorphism. Regular mono and split mono, no. Yeah, this is def these are defined independently. But uh, oh yeah, I think split monos can be treated as regular monos. Split monos are regular monos because if you have a splitting, suppose. E is a split mono, then there is some E prime which works. Yeah, so okay, I will just write it as a property. Split monos are regular. So suppose you are given this. So C, D that is E, and you have E prime. This is clearly a surjection. Uh, this is an epimorphism. The splitting is an epimorphism. So then you can take two different maps, yeah, from D to D. One is identity D, and the second one is this composition, E E prime. So E will be the equalizer of these two arrows. And this is actually you, you made me prove that all in, in the category of sets, regular monos are precisely monos because monos are precisely split monos. Right? Okay. So, uh, regular epis are precisely surjective functions in sets. If you remember, we said that split epis and surjective functions, they don't have this relationship unless you assume the axiom of choice. But regular epis and surjections, they are precisely the same. And this is a good exercise for you to understand the dual concept of regular epimorphisms and work with them in this category. And similarly, uh, in the category of groups, also the same thing will happen. Yeah. However, uh, in the this part, the second part is also true. I mean, maybe this is second example by now. Let me go back up. This is the first one, then third one. So in rings, we found some epimorphisms which were not surjective maps, yeah, the localization maps. So uh, Z to Q in particular. However, regular monomorphisms are more natural. So regular epi if and only if surjection. Try to see if you can prove these things. Then 
in the category of topological spaces what are regular monomorphisms so regular monomorphism is uh, inclusions of up to isomorphism okay up to iso inclusions of subspaces these are regular monomorphisms inclusion of subspaces you understand that the topology is precisely the restriction of the topology on the bigger set and regular epimorphisms this is also quotient maps so quotient topology if you know then these are precisely the quotient maps you understand this so these are all exercises yeah it, I, i have just written them down but you have to verify so uh, like the story is so far is that we saw what is a terminal object initial object equalizers co equalizers they all look very different but the proper the underlying properties are exactly similar we are asking for some universal property we are asking for some best possible solution which uh, for a given problem the given problem is going to be some sort of commutative diagram and we are asking for a best possible solution now can we generalize all these things to a common ground and the answer to that is yes they are called categorical properties or in particular we i mean uh, what we are talking about are called limits and colimits yeah so limits and colimits are extremely important things in category theory and in order to understand limits and colimits we need to go through some other exercise we want to construct some new kind of uh categories from existing categories so i'm going to give you two different ways so constructing new categories from old ones sometimes uh, you are working in a category and you want to understand only the fraction of that category only the part that is visible by placing a visible from a particular location like you placed an observer in that category at an object and then you want to under, uh, see what what kind of things you can see okay so that's called a slice category you are looking for a slice of your original category so first one is slice category this is perhaps the most simple thing so c is a category and c is an object out of c the slice category has so objects of the slice c c by c yeah are morphisms uh i mean are pairs maybe i, I should write them as pairs pairs a comma f where f is a morphism from a to c and what are morphisms morphisms in the slice category they are defined between yeah these are commutative diagrams okay so in particular i have to be specific like if i'm talking about af and then i'm talking about bg then this the morphism is h 
such that h will make the diagram commute so let me write that so this is f okay then i am talking about b so b to c there is a morphism g and h is a morphism from a to b which makes the diagram commute yeah such that uh, gh is equal to f <coughs> Can you see why we are talking about a slice? Yeah, that we are placing an observer at a particular object capital C and then we are only looking at what's coming to you, the incoming traffic and then all the ways in which you can connect those two, that's called a morphism. Yeah, no, not all morphisms from A to B are going to be morphisms in this slice category. You have to satisfy this commutativity condition. In particular, like this is not something very awkward, okay? So, uh, note that if T is a terminal, terminal object in C, then the slice category C mod T is isomorphic to C. Why is it isomorphic? Because what is going to be F, A comma F, what is going to be F? F is the unique map. So, the commutativity condition is always true, it does not matter, yeah, so it is as if it is non-existent. So, therefore, you are just getting back your original category up to isomorphism. So, yeah, if there is a terminal object, then the collection of all slices, if you have some property for all slices, then you also have a prop, uh, the same property for the category itself. Understood? What is true for all ABC? Object C is fixed. Okay. If you see the uh, in the objects for this category, slice category, we are just writing a comma f yeah we are not explicitly mentioning c because c is fixed in the background yeah even though f is a morphism with target c always yeah but if you change the slice then you will get different things if you take a two element set for example in the category of sets as your c then what is it no, two element set is perhaps no, not a good choice. Uh, like a co slice with terminal. Yeah, co slice category. Co slice category, I am just going to write it like C mod C. Yeah, it is written this way. And these are all arrows going away from that and all morphisms which make this diagram commutative. Yeah, you simply change all the arrows. Direction of G is also going out. Uh, this one does not have to change. No, H is like I am saying that H is a morphism from A comma F to B comma G. Yeah, perhaps I have changed the ordering of like labeling of A and B yeah, when <laughs> I dualize the diagram. So, this is a co slice category. If I is an initial object, then the co slice at I is again going to be isomorphic to the original category. But if you take all these singletons, then what is really happening? 
like if C happens to be a singleton set, terminal object, then an arrow is an element. Yeah, it's a set together with like an object of the Coslas category is a set together with an element. Yeah, so it's a pointed set. And then you have to, uh, you are recovering that uh, the category of pointed sets from this, yeah. So, if i is initial, then the co-slice is isomorphic to C. If T is terminal, um, yeah, let me just say the co-slice at terminal uh, in sets is isomorphic to the category of pointed sets and point preserving functions. You understand this? Yeah, that's all the requirement we have. So, you can see that we are creating, we can create lot of things just by doing this. Just taking slices and co-slices. Now, let us take this up one notch and define something called an arrow category. In literature for category theory, there is also another name for category of arrows. Yeah, we are not talking about that. We are just talking about the arrow category here. And we are going to do the slice version of that first. So, let f be a functor and uh, b is a fixed object of d. Then uh, we define the arrow category f arrow b. Okay. What is the, uh, what are the objects? Objects are A comma F, where A is an object in C and F is a morphism from F A to B. And what are morphisms? So, from A F to A prime F prime, the morphisms are those H's where H is a morphism from A to A prime in category C such that this triangle commutes. What is the triangle? We have F A to B, we have F A prime to B prime uh, to B this is f prime, this is f and this is, what is this arrow? f h, yeah, this is f h, such that this commutes. So, we are trying to encode lot of data here, yeah, we are fixing an object in the target category and we are uh, taking objects which are pairs. Yeah, you, yeah, you will take some time to understand what is really going on here. But uh, you can imagine that perhaps there is uh, some similarity between our original slice category and arrow category. Can you recover a slice category as an arrow category? Identity functor, very good. Identity functor. So, the slice category C mod C is nothing but Uh, 
uh, sorry I should draw an arrow one sub c arrow c dearly can you define the other arrow categories yeah where the object is fixed in this source category is it true is that the dual object is fixed in the source category will that work at all we should take op of what yes exactly that's my question like sometimes people think that taking the dual version is very easy yeah it's it's not that straightforward if you know this logic that slice is nothing but 1c arrow c then co slice is going to be c arrow 1c but what exactly are we doing d op no d op is not really the right thing the arrow uh, the opposite uh, the dual version is this the other arrow category is simply b arrow f okay you are just taking i mean i will just draw the commutative diagram so that you can understand so this is f this is f prime and this is fh this diagram commutes there are generalizations of this also yeah i mean in both uh, components you can take functors so there is a pair of functors mapping into the same category same target category there is c d and e to d there are two functors and you can play the same game yeah. in category theory everything has a generalization so <laughs> but so far we will only need these yeah in the slice category arrow category and their dual versions is this clear this idea okay so now we are ready to define limits and co limits okay so limit is always assigned to a diagram yeah and that diagram has a shape usually the shape is small but there is a shape so let j be a shape category yeah there is no definition but i'm just going to say usually small category there will be only one instance when we will have to relax this condition yeah j is a small category and we uh, we call it the shape category j is any small category no so this is the shape of that limit we are going to talk about that yeah so for example this is a shape there are two arrows between two parallel arrows between two objects this is a shape yeah then there is also just this a shape i'm not even labeling them yeah then maybe this is a shape any small category would do every small category is a shape okay so uh, let a functor yeah a functor from 
we are going to call it d from j to c is called a diagram of shape j so basically when i take this first shape let's say this parallel arrows when i map like take a functor from this shape to a category then i am replacing those objects with objects of c and i am replacing the morphisms by morphisms between those objects of c so that's a diagram okay so this is a diagram of shape j and we are trying to understand uh, something yeah now there could be two different diagrams i mean uh, give me some some simple example of a diagram let's let's see if you can construct if you know a one object exists in category c can you give me some example of a diagram function to itself from what to what no no you have to be more specific so for any c in objects of c there is a diagram what uh, what does that diagram do i'm going to say delta yeah this is a diagram delta of c from j to c that takes what does that do that takes yes every object little j of j to c and every morphism j to j prime in j to identity of c we always have this diagram i have written delta because it's the constant diagram yeah constant diagram of value j with value c okay now because we are doing category theory do we really stop when we have a map from objects to objects we should do morphisms to morphism so now if we have a morphism from c to c prime then we have a corresponding morphism from delta c to delta c prime yeah the construction delta is functorial in c yeah basically so i e delta is a functor from c to the category of functors from j to c so what happened i mean if this is my shape yeah i mean i i'll give you an example if this is my shape yeah the green one highlighted green one then what was the original diagram so we had c to c prime in in c let me call this f then what was delta c and delta c prime well delta c is just going to be c and a pair of arrows 1c 1c and this is this 1c 1c c prime to c prime and what do we need we have a pair of morphisms ff such that uh, this outer triangle commutes 
a outer rectangle commutes this one and similarly the inner rect uh, rectangle also commutes both of them will commute that is precisely what we mean by it being a functor so what we are saying is that delta yeah so let me go back so what i'm saying is delta of f is a natural transformation from delta c to delta c prime because we have seen this is the functor category jc the objects there are functors those functors are called diagrams and the morphisms there are natural transformations so this is a natural transformation delta f is a natural transformation from delta c to delta c prime do you agree with that if you remember what is the definition of natural transformation then for this particular shape you require that these two purple squares or rectangles they commute that's the only condition some of you are lost if you have any questions tell me because there are two parallel arrows what do we say what do we say for a natural transformation for every object in the original diagram there should be one arrow yes so that arrow is the vertical one such that for ff and gf they have to agree yes so this is this first identity is ff the second and then this is fg and this is gf and gg there are different things happening here try to put everything together Yeah. Okay, so the, therefore, delta f is indeed a natural transformation from delta c to delta c prime. Okay, now we are at the right setup. We have got one category, a uh, one functor. and we want to talk about one particular object see what did we start with originally we were given a functor d from j to c correct a functor was given now we have found like this this functor is an object of the target category of delta okay and we are given a functor with this target category so now we have the correct setup for for the arrow category and what will be that arrow category delta arrow d okay so consider the arrow category delta arrow d okay what are the objects let's just revise the objects are you are you are supposed to start with pairs objects are pairs right you have to choose something from c c in object of c and some morphism right some morphism from its image so delta c to d okay and this is what we call theta 
yeah theta is a natural transformation from delta c to d okay now let uh, let me try to draw this diagram i am going to uh, for this particular picture okay we have j1 and j2 two objects and let me call this one alpha and this one beta this is our j what is going to be delta c delta c will be c c identity identity then at the bottom what do i have it's dj1 and dj2 this is my actual diagram yeah this is d alpha and this is my d beta d alpha d beta and then i need a natural transformation so natural transformation is given by these vertical maps the first one is theta j1 and the second arrow is theta j2 such that this whole thing commutes yeah commutes means what that theta j2 composed with the upper identity is equal to d alpha composed with theta j1 and theta j2 composed with lower identity is equal to d beta composed with theta j1 yes both those uh, square should commute appropriately however this situation yeah i mean you can see there is this top layer of this particular diagram that top layer has got some redundant information everywhere we are just talking about c c and 1c 1c identity of c so it has got lot of redundant information so just like in topology i mean if you think of this as a filled up square yeah i mean this is a filled up rectangle and in topology if the top two corners of that they are exactly the same then you might want to pinch them into a single point so actually that is also possible here see i am going to convert this diagram into something like this i don't really care about identity identity i just care about one object and this so theta j1 theta j2 so just like in topology we call this a cone over the diagram okay so this is and so objects are this i e cones over diagram d with summit c i mean this is this is a cone sorry i e a cone over diagram d with summit c summit is the topmost vertex that is what we are choosing yeah so you can see we we can, we started with some very complicated thing yeah what was that complicated thing the an object of an arrow category but what we are really doing we are just taking a cone over this diagram if i had said cone you would have understood yeah you are taking a diagram base diagram and what what should be satisfied here well we are saying that d alpha composed with theta j1 is equal to d beta composed with theta j1 is equal to theta j2 that's all we are saying now uh, okay these are the objects and what are going to be the morphisms well morphisms are morphisms from c to c prime such that this whole thing happens so let me 
scroll it down. So the morphisms here are morphisms uh, in C. Let me call it F C to C prime such that the cones commute. Yeah, I mean, I, let me just write it in terms of cones. Yeah, that for C you have got this outside thing. This is DJ1. This is DJ2. And we have got D alpha, D beta. And for C prime also, I have got a similar situation. I will just call this theta prime J1. This is theta prime J2. This is theta J1. This is theta J2. And the morphism here is just F. And this F makes these two triangles commute. If you write everything properly, then this is what you will get. Yeah, the in this arrow category, such that this diagram, such that the uh, the following diagram. commutes. Okay, so these corner triangles, these are the important ones. They commute. Okay, now any questions so far? Look at this. Yeah, I am uh, taking your attention to just this part. D alpha theta J1 is equal to D beta theta J1. Yeah. Theta J2 is the connecting piece of information for these two. How can I obtain theta J2? Like theta J2 is a redundant leg of this diagram. Okay. So, in this diagram, we uh, this is just some piece of notation. This is the summit and this is a leg. Legs of the cone. And this is a redundant leg. Because theta j2 I can already obtain by composing d alpha with theta j1 or equivalently d beta with theta j2. I don't uh, j1. I don't need to talk about explicitly the leg theta j2. So, what is really a cone over this diagram? If I remove the redundancy, then a cone is simply this. Yeah? After removing redundancy, What do I get? I just get this. D alpha, D beta. This is a pair of parallel morphisms in the original diagram and I have theta J1 over here. Is this diagram familiar to you? Equalizer, but equalizer would be the universal such thing, right? We haven't yet asked for that. Okay, so now I am ready to define what is the limit. Say that a limit of diagram D from J to C exists if the arrow category delta arrow D has a terminal object. Okay, so this and we write 
limit of d of shape j equal to uh, c comma theta j j in object of j this data okay uh, where this is the yeah where rhs is the terminal object so what is a terminal object it is simply one object of category c together with i mean that is the summit of that cone so the limit cone has one object and legs okay so basically the limit cone here uh, would be i mean if you want uh, i can call it let's say c bar instead of c the limit cone in this diagram would be this c bar to dj okay uh, maybe we can also call it theta bar j so theta bar j1 such that there is a unique arrow why does there exist a unique arrow because it's a terminal amongst all such objects amongst all such cones it is the terminal cone okay so that's uh, that's the definition of a limit now it's very abstract yeah the, we start started with a shape then we took the diagram but actually it's not that hard it's just difficult to express it in categorical language it's a terminal object of some category now what is that category you have to understand and the idea as you can see like uh, maclean and eilenberg who uh, started this subject who wrote down the axioms of category theory they were topologists so you can see the idea of cone being used a commutative square is like a cylinder and then you are pinching one side that's a cone yeah so very beautiful idea like it looks very complicated but it's very simple relatively yeah the actual idea is very simple okay so uh, there is some more terminology naturally and that is of dual dually we have a cone under a diagram d what will that be cone under a diagram it will be an object of the other arrow category yeah i e an object of the uh, arrow category d arrow delta and we say that the co limit that a co limit yeah i shouldn't even talk about a co limit of d exists if this arrow category has an initial object okay so that initial object is going to be the uh, co limit now i'm sure most of you are confused about this lot uh, this bunch of notation but let's do something simple yeah yeah no we don't use them we don't need to yeah we only need the terminal cone over a diagram 
and we need an initial cone under a diagram. If they exist, then only they they matter. Yeah, otherwise they don't. We want the best possible solution for a certain problem. I'm just going to show you some examples and then we'll proceed uh, with some general theory. So let's do some examples. So take the shape to be empty. Let J be the empty category. Perhaps this is not the simplest possible example. If J is the empty category, then what happens? What are, what is a diagram? In a diagram, nothing happens. Yeah, J to C, that's a diagram. So, uh, so that D is empty. The diagram itself is empty. Okay. So, what will be delta uh, arrow D? Then delta arrow D has as objects just C comma nothing, no morphism. Yeah, it's just an object of our original category. And morphisms are just morphisms of the original category. There are no conditions to be satisfied, no triangle to be satisfied. So therefore, a terminal object, yeah, i.e., I mean, uh, I should say, delta arrow D in this case is isomorphic to C. Yeah, nothing else is happening. Isomorphism of categories. And therefore, Limit of shape J is, is a ter terminal object. Of C. Okay, so it's just a terminal. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's increase the complexity a bit. Let J be a single object discrete category. Okay, what is a diagram in this case? D from J to C. It's a single object discrete category, only arrow is identity. So what's the diagram? Identity goes to identity. So you are just choosing one particular object. That's all. Hmm? So uh, it's one object. So that a diagram is D is a single object. Okay, so now you, you are given a single object. Let me call that object A. Now what is going to be a cone over this diagram? Cone is simply a choice of object <coughs> with a morphism. Correct? A cone is a choice of object of C together with a single morphism. This is the C is the summit and this morphism is the leg of this cone. Yeah, this is summit and this is leg. And now I am asking you this question, does there exist a terminal cone like this through which every other cone factors. What? Yes. Yeah. So the limit of this diagram, uh, so this, let's say this is a, this diagram is A comma identity A. 
okay you are simply recovering yeah let me write this so a is with identity a there always exists a unique arrow what is that unique arrow namely f itself such that this diagram commutes okay so these examples will at least convince you that the idea of limit is not that hard what will be the co-limit of this diagram? It's again the same thing, a comma identity. Yeah, it's a cone under a diagram, but again you have to factor through a comma identity. In in case one, what is, what was the name of the co-limit of empty shape? It is the initial object. Okay, it's the initial object of the original category C itself because it's a cone under the diagram. Okay, so let's do a slightly complicated example. So J is J1 and J2, just two objects. Now, what is a cone over this diagram? How many legs will it have? As many objects. Yes. So, I am not going to write anything. A diagram is just going to be A comma B. A cone over this is just going to be a pair of morphisms. I am just going to call them F and G. And what will be the universal cone? If A and B are sets, then does there exist something here yeah, so, uh, together with some arrows such that there always exists a unique factorization. Is there a universal object satisfying this property? A intersection B. No, we are not talking about inclusion here. Intersection is not correct. Cartesian product with projection maps okay so let me write that so here we are talking about a cross b here we are to, uh, like uh, talking about sets and pi 1 and pi 2 what is the map from c to a cross b the factorization unique factorization which makes this work what is that map f comma g in the first component it just maps to f that's the only thing you can do in the second component it maps to g and now if you check then f comma g composed with pi 1 will give you f and f comma g composed with pi 2 will give you g so a uh, limit of this shape is called a product with projection maps yeah so projection maps are important i mean that object together with this pair of projection maps that is what our product is Generally in set theory, because set theory is all about the internal structure, so we forget about the maps conveniently. Yeah, but products cannot exist without projection maps. Yeah, so product is actually this tuple. Okay, one uh, like before we go any further, I should say that the limit of uh, a limit of a diagram. if exists is unique up to unique isomorphism can you understand why because a limit is a terminal object in some category so that's always unique up to unique isomorphism Similarly, I mean, 
co-limit also. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, now I can talk about like I wanted to say this because then I can say the product is a cross b comma pi 1 comma pi 2. This is our common notation. A cross B is the notation. Now, whether it is actually Cartesian product or not in a given category, that's irrelevant. The notation is always this. Now, dually, yeah, dually initial object, then dually just A comma A, one A. This doesn't really change. Like this uh, second example is actually boring. Yeah, nothing is happening there. You just factor through identity. And dually, this is called a co-product. And we write A plus B with co-projections. Nu1 and nu2. Yeah, these are called co-projections. Uh, just for your help, I am going to draw this diagram of co-projections like we are given A and B and then A plus B and this is my nu1, this is my nu2 and uh, finally I have some other cone under the diagram. Some people also call it a co-cone yeah, but we are not, huh? no. Cone and no, no. <laughs> That's <laughs> not fair. And the morphism here, yeah, if these are morphisms F and G, then we uh, call it, uh, sorry, we usually write them vertically. Yeah. F and G. So you can think of it as the sum map. You are choosing one entry from A and another entry from B and then whatever their images in C are, then you are taking their sum. Okay, so products are of this kind. Now, instead of talking about general shapes, let us do another example. Now, if, I mean this is the same example. If uh, P is a faucet, and uh, yeah, thought of as a category, then product of two elements. A and B is, is what? The so called meat is their meat and it is written A meat B. The dual version is the, the co product. and it is called join. Now, let me give you the diagram for this A, B and then A meet B and then there is some C. What is the meaning of arrows? Arrows means in a post set, what are, what are arrows? Less equal signs, right? So, what we are saying, now read the universal property. Universal property says that whenever C is less equal A and C is less equal B, then C is less equal A mid B. Right? So, if you are thinking about the power set of a set, then meet is just going to be the intersection. In this case, actually less equal signs exist that much is sufficient. Yeah, uh, You do not really need these maps. Maps are just less equal. So, 
you will say that the product is nothing but just that element. It's enough to talk about that element. Similarly, co-product is the join. In the power set, it will be the union. Yeah. So, uh, if in particular, now this is I'm, me answering your question earlier. Uh, at the beginning of the course, we started with a question. If we are talking about natural numbers with without zero, uh, with the with zero is also allowed, and divisibility. So in divisibility post set, this is a post set, and in this there will be products for any pair. The products are. GCD something divides something something divides something then it must divide the GCD of both of them and co-products are yes this particular post set like for uh, any foundation is uh, person natural numbers always contain zero so one is the initial object. One divides everything and everything divides zero. Yeah, so I am saying uh, zero, uh, sorry, one is the initial object. And zero is the terminal object. I will make just one comment. If you do not want to get confused between limits and co-limits, always make sure all your arrows point more or less downwards. Limits are always cones over the diagram and they are closest to the diagram and co-limits are always cones under the diagram and they are closest to the diagram. If you change the order, you will get confused. One last thing, we say that, yeah, I mean this is a part of now theory, say that category, a category C has limits of shape J. If for each diagram D from J to C, the uh, limit of D exists. Okay, so, dual you can write down about co-limits that C has co-limits of shape J, if for each diagram the co-limit of D exists. See by changing the diagram I mean for example in a post set by changing the diagram I mean changing the elements. It can happen that in a certain post set a particular pair of elements has a meet. But there is another pair which does not have a meet. They do not even have a common lower bound. Yeah, that is always a possibility. Right? So, therefore, you have to understand the difference between existence of limit for a particular diagram and existence of limit for all diagrams of that particular shape. Let us stop.